morning everybody and if you don't know my name is Jessica and I'm with the Museum of Ontario Archaeology uh, and I'm with uh, here with another episode of Resources of the Medway Valley and as you saw from our little title card we are going to be talking about all things maple today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the trees, we're going to talk a bit about the history, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you get the sap to become syrup. Um, so the whole harvesting process. Um, now, just some intro facts. Canada is, as you might know, the world's leading producer and exporter of maple products. So they account for 71% of the global market, which is well over half of it, um, 50%. Um, so there's a bit in the northern U.S., in Vermont and Connecticut, even a little bit as low as like South, um, excuse me, not South Carolina, goodness, um, in, in Pennsylvania a bit. Um, but it's just a matter of it needs to get cold. So it has to be in the northern part of the U.S., and Canada just so happens to get really cold in the winter. Um, now, the province that has the ability, is the largest producer is Quebec. Um, they make, I don't know what the percentage is, but I think it is, if not 50% of that 71%, it's around 40%, somewhere around there. Um, so they account for a pretty large portion of what that maple product is that goes out into the world that everybody can buy. Um, now, chances are you probably know more about um, maple trees and products and different things like that and how you go from sap to sugar and all that. Um, you probably know a little bit more about that because I'm sure you've probably been on field trips and had visits to sugar shacks. And unfortunately, I have not ever really been to one. Um, so what I know is from my own research as well as from the couple of workshops that I've been to that are about maple syrup and processing and all that stuff. So if at any point you just want to share a fun fact in the comments, feel free to do that. I love learning. Um, you love learning. Everybody here, we all like learning new things. So just pop a comment in about any sort of fun fact you might have learned on your trip to a sugar shack or sugar bush. Now the first thing we're going to talk about are good, is going to be the trees. So here's a picture of a sugar maple. <laughs> there are 10 species of maple trees that are native to Canada. Um, I'm not going to rattle those all off, um, but three that are the most important to maple syrup production are the sugar maple of course, and then you can also use the black maple and the red maple. Um, now the reason that the sugar maple is the best of those top three is because it has the most sugar content of any maple species. Um, so it's sweeter. The sap it might really not taste any different, but the sugar content inside exceeds any of the black and red maple. So you can use any of those, but the sugar maple is probably the best. Um, the also really interesting thing about maple trees is that they're really long lived. Um, so there's trees like, like bristlecone pines could live thousands of years. Um, but as far as like a deciduous tree, which is a tree that loses its leaves in the uh, winter months, um, it lives a really long time. Um, so there's been maple trees that are 200 years old or older. And also you can, if you cut one of those trees down, you can see how far back that tree was tapped to harvest that maple syrup um, or the sap for maple syrup. Um, and that can actually be traced 150 years back or more. So people have been tapping trees since time infinite, really. Um, a little bit more about the characteristic of the trees is, of course, you've probably seen these, are the fruit. You're probably like, that's not a fruit. It's not an apple. But these are actually the fruit of the maple tree. Um, it's the part that contains the seeds. So I'm sure you have plenty of names. I've heard maple keys. I've heard whirly gigs. I've heard helicopters. Um, the proper name for these are Samaras, Samaras, something like that. Kind of sounds like a cookie. <laughs> um, um, and all this is, is it's their seeds inside of these little feather out sort of wings. Um, and when they fall, they helicopter down and land gently on the ground so that the seeds aren't damaged. So it's kind of a neat evolution that the maple tree has had. And then finally, with the leaves of a maple tree, they're super recognizable. They're on the flag of Canada, um, but they do sometimes look a little bit different. Um, the leaves of a lot of maples, specifically the sugar maple, has something called lobes. And I'm going to show you a picture to show you what that looks like. So as you saw, and this isn't a sugar maple leaf, I don't believe. Um, I think this is a Norway maple. <laughs> a lobe is just one of these sections where it comes out in a point before it ends in what's called a sinus or this little divot, this V shape. Um, so most maples will have the five. So here's... Uh, one, let me see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, um, and the biggest, most present one is at the top there. 
Um, so the maples have five lobes, and that's just one way to identify it by its leaf. Now to get into the history of it, just briefly, um, indigenous peoples have practice the earliest method of uh, collecting sap from maple trees. Um, and how they did that is they would make a gash in the tree down to the part where the sap is, um, and that would be in an X or a Y shape. They'd insert a hollowed out reed or a wedge, and that would direct the sap from the tree into a birch bark bowl. And they would collect that sap, they would take it to um, either a hollowed out log, and they would uh, put hot rocks in it because they didn't really have any sort of pots. So using those hot rocks, that would boil all of that water up. And that's a really important part as well. You need to boil the water off from the sap in order to get to that sweet part, which is the syrup. Um, so the longer you boil it, you're eventually gonna end up with maple sugar. Um, so they would use that um, syrup and sugar as, of course, a food source. You could use it to sweeten things like soups and stews, or you could use it as a preservative for meats and berries so that you could winter with that. Now, when the settlers came, the indigenous people taught them how to harvest this maple sap so that they could make their own syrup. And it was pretty much the same way. They had some more unique tools. They had pots and things that they could use um, to boil it. But it was pretty much the same method. They would collect the sap. They would take it back to a sugar shack or another place that they could process it and boil that water off. Um, so we learned how to do that. Now, today, more modern harvesting part that you're probably a bit more um, used to. Now, when you're harvesting maple sap, there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. It needs to be in winter. And that's because A, <laughs> the sugar maple's uh, sugar um, content is really mature during that time. So you're gonna get the most sweet um, it, at that period of time. It's gonna be the, the best point to harvest, really, is the best way you can put it. <laughs> Um, and then also the sap flow is really dependent on the season. So you can't, as you know, harvest, there's not people harvesting maple um, sap in the summertime. And the reason why is because you need it to get below freezing in the winter and above freezing in the summer. So what that does is it creates pressure within the tree and that forces the sap out. So you're not drilling a bunch of holes on the same tree. You're only drilling one and tapping it. And then that pushes the sap out. The tree's doing the work itself. Um, now today you still sometimes have the, um, the, uh, buckets that you use. So it's a metal tap and you hang the bucket on it and hooray, hooray, you get your sap collected in there. Um, but there's a lot better ways that there's better ways of doing that. Um, and those are these vacuum tube systems. Here's a picture of what that looks like. So if you're ever driving around through the wooded areas and you see those webs of blue tubes, that's just these vacuum tubes and they're all connected to the trees and they connect to one main line and then they go all the way back to a sugar sack. So that saves people a lot of time instead of going and grabbing the buckets and bringing them back. They just have one line and it does the work for them. So it's a whole lot easier than having to deal with like hundreds upon hundreds of buckets. Um, now, as far as the boiling process goes anymore, the water, of course, as I said, needs to be boiled out so it can become syrup. So they have these really big fancy vats now, and here's what one of those looks like. So it is super techy looking. There's dials and buttons galore. Um, but that's really the process. It just boils it off. Eventually you end up with a syrup. And the trick is it actually takes about 30 to 45 liters of sap from a tree to even make one liter of pure maple syrup. So you need a ton of trees to be able to do this. So that's why maple producers, so maple farms and sugar bushes, have just endless amounts of maple trees because you just need so many to make so little. All right, with that being said, it's a big long process. Um, we're gonna head over into my kitchen actually to do a kind of quick craft. It depends how long it takes you. Um, and I'll walk you through that process. See you in there. All right, so we are going to be making these little salt dough maple leaf ornaments. So I am going to go ahead and I'm going to grab my materials and we will go through that and then start learning all the what we have to do to exactly make these things. All right, so everything we need to make those very cute little ornaments are as follows. So we're gonna need a mixing bowl. It doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be able to hold a bit of dough. 
Uh, we're also going to need a dry measuring cup for our flour and salt, and also a wet measuring cup for water. Um, now, the recipe I'm using I found on uh, allrecipes.com, which is just pretty much a general hodgepodge of pretty much every recipe you'd ever want. Um, so, um, just to let you know, that's where I found this, but pretty much all of the salt dough recipes I was looking at are pretty much roughly the same, uh, where it's kind of two parts flour and then one part water and salt. Um, so basically what that means is you have two times the amount of flour as you do salt and water. Um, so in this case, it's going to call for two cups of all-purpose flour, which I have in there. And then a cup of salt, and it has to be table salt. It doesn't, uh, it's not like kosher or sea salt or anything like that. Nothing fancy, because <laughs> we're not even going to be able to enjoy this. And then the water. So, to measure that out, always remember with the flour, it's really important that you score the top so that you're not over measuring stuff. So let me bring this here so I'm not making a mess. And that's also really important, too. This is extra fun if you do it with another person. That way, if you choose to be messy, you can blame each other. <laughs> Nobody's going to come home and be surprised and ask who did that mess. Yeah. I'm use this. That's better. A knife works better for this sort of stuff. Doesn't have to be like a super sharp knife. That's just the first one that I grabbed there. So there's our two cups of flour. And then for the salt, same thing. And if you also want to half it, I went out and I got some extra salt um, when I went grocery shopping last. So I'm just going to make the um, full recipe. I'm not going to bother halving it. Ooh, there we go. My mom, she is not going to be pleased. <laughs> Um, if you want to half it, really all you have to do is you just have to make half of your measurements. So two cups of flour is only one cup of flour if you half it, and then for the salt and the water, you're only going to do a half cup each. All right, so then we do that. Now, of course, that makes it completely inedible, so don't eat the dough. Also, don't give it to your dogs because dogs are not able to eat this, um, so just be careful when you do that. Now, to get the dough consistency, I believe it would work better with a wooden spoon to be able to, like, mix everything up. Um, but it, whatever you have, I have a rubber spatula, that'll work fine as well. Um, so with the water, you just want to add a bit at a time. Maybe, I've, I've seen, you know, add only a tablespoon at a time. And that's because the measurement for the water, anytime I've ever made salt dough, it's never super perfect, I should say. Because you want, like, a dough consistency. You almost want to make it feel like you're making bread. Um, so you want that similar kind of, like, semi-sticky, but, like, doughy consistency. And so in some cases, that'll work um, if you, you know, you might have the perfect measurement with a cup, but in other cases, you might have to add a little more water. You might have to add... Um, not add as much. You can, of course, like take any water out. So you just have to be careful with how much you're adding because if you do make a mistake, then you have to just kind of play around and, you know, add more flour to get it um, back to like a drier consistency. And the good thing is, again, we're not eating this, so it doesn't have to be by taste or anything. Um, it just has to be that it'll bake in the oven for a bit. And I should also say, let's see. Um, you do need the oven to be preheated to, oh good, Celsius is here, 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, so you do want to get that preheated a while so that you're not waiting however long it takes your oven to preheat. So you can see it's starting to get a little clumpy. We're getting there. It's a process, right guys? All right, I'm going to fast forward a bit until we get to a point where I can start actually almost being able to knead this. So I will be right back. 
All right, so pretty much what you didn't see was I went around and I was trying to get the perfect consistency for my dough. So I was adding some flour and some more salt so it wasn't as sticky and watery. So I finally got to a point where it's pretty good. It feels kind of like bread dough or like cookie dough. Um, so it's not super sticky and it's not really wet. Um, so all you really have to do then is knead it just like you would uh, bread dough. So just kind of roll it between, make sure everything's mixed together really well, and then just let it sit for about 20 minutes is what the recipe says. Um, and then I have this little gel mat here, so it's not going to stick to anything really. Um, you can use parchment paper also. And you're just going to roll it out using a rolling pen there. Now to get the shape of the maple leaf, I'm actually using a real maple leaf. Um, I believe this is from a Norway maple. Um, we had a windstorm and it blew down a whole bunch of leaves, so that's one way to get the leaves. If not, if you have a cookie cutter, um, if you just want to print a design out from online, you can do that too. Or if you want to use an actual leaf, you can just go outside and find a bunch of leaves. I mean, they're everywhere. You can use an oak leaf or just from anything. So we're just going to press that down on it, and by doing that we'll get the imprint from the veins on the back of the leaf, and I'm actually going to go over just gently with the rolling pin, make sure it's down really well. And I have a toothpick here that I am going to trace around that with. And now with the points, the might not be perfect, so just work with them a little bit. Make them maybe a little bit more round. If you want to not use the toothpick first, you can totally do that too, because you can, if you have like a plastic knife or something, like this one. And also what I did just to make it a little easier on myself is um, instead of using all of the dough right away if you cut a piece off and that's awesome if you have like any siblings or anybody else who wants to be making this with you um, so you can each have a little piece of it instead of trying to share it and cut out from the same Right, clean up my edges a little bit here. Got a little messed up. And again, if it's not absolutely 100% perfect on the little edges, I mean, it's really hard. You have your points, um, your little lobes, as they are called, right, from the video. And then if we gently pull this little leaf off here, you can kind of see there are little veins. So there we have it. off there. All right, so the next trick is going to be trying to get this from our um, mat onto our, I lined a cookie pan with uh, parchment paper. So just using a spatula, try to get under it. Um, I should say, actually, what you do have to do is if you want to be able to make it an ornament, I have a little plastic straw here. You can use the end of pretty much any sort of tool that's round. Um, just a bit down, punch a hole in it. Boop. And then that way you'll have somewhere to put your string. So whether or not the veins stay on, um, it's all right. It looks pretty cool right now, honestly. Um, so I'm going to put those onto the cookie sheets and all you have to do to bake them is it does take a while. It takes two hours because it needs to like completely dry and harden. Um, so just keep your eye on it so it doesn't burn or burst into flames or anything like that. We really don't want that. Um, but once it is totally done cooking, I'll come back and I'll show you guys what mine looks like. All right, well, I don't know about you guys, but I am pretty proud of how my little maple leaves turned out. Um, all I really did was put on some acrylic paint on it, and you can actually even still see the little veins, which is pretty cool. Um, you don't have to if you like to keep it plain, like my first one here. Uh, totally feel free to do that. Uh, no rules. <laughs> um, so I used green for this one. I have red. And then I also made the little maple keys, the little Samaras. 
right here. Um, they worked out okay. You can't really tell what they are, but if you see it next to a maple leaf, you might know that those are the little the little whirly gigs that come down with the tree. Um, now, just to finish it off, I have some yarn. I don't really know what you want to call it here. It's, I think, just like a, a rope sort of material twine. Um, but if you have ribbon or yarn or whatever, um, I'm just kind of have like this very plain stuff. Um, all you do is you fold it in half, so you have like a loop, and then what I like to do is I take the loop end and I wiggle it um, through the hole, just like that, pull it through about halfway, and so I don't pull the whole end through, I take the two loose ends here and I just pop them through that loop, just like that, and that makes a little hitch to hold it in place. And then just to tie the top end off there, you just fold those ends around and again, just stick it through the loop. You can ask for help for this part. It is a little tricky if you don't know. And then just like that, pull it nice and tight and you have a nice little ornament. You can hang it on doorknobs or on hooks around your house. Maybe for Canada Day, that's coming up in ooh, about a month, a little more, uh, a little less than that even. Um, so yeah, you have all those little decorations there. Um, and also, I ended up with a ton of leftover. I probably should have had my recipe. <laughs> um, I didn't want to make a whole lot of them because I didn't know what I was going to do with them. Um, so you can keep that. It's pretty much just like Play-Doh. I don't think it really goes bad unless you like have it in like a not airtight container. So just stick it in a container. Um, put some. I put some plastic wrap on top just to make sure it was nice and airproof. And you can just stick it in like a craft bucket or keep it for a rainy day if you want to feel like making a couple little figurines or make some fake pretzels or whatever you want to do with that. Um, now that's pretty much it for the craft. Um, uh, just a reminder, um, if you haven't already, check out our uh, camp kits. You've been hearing people talk about that on our website. And then also coming up this week, as usual, we have Heather tomorrow at 1 p.m. on Facebook Live doing her hashtag MOA Live Talks and Katie at 10 a.m. on Facebook Live doing one of her Mad Lives. Um, all that said, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in and you guys stay safe.